Good morning. I think we are going to get started on time, and um, I, I'd like to begin by welcoming you all to today's event, which is fostering competition in the pharmaceutical distribution chain. Uh, this this conference is a joint product of the Schaefer Initiative for Innovation and in Health Policy, which uh, combines the expertise and collaboration between Brookings and the Schaefer Center at the University of Southern California. My name is Dana Goldman. I'm the director of the Schaefer Center. Uh, I'm also part of the Schaefer Initiative team. And I'd like to especially thank Leonard Schaefer, who's not with us today, uh, for making today's event possible. And also extend uh, my uh, thanks to Brookings for uh, hosting this and providing an opportunity to have this discussion. I think a, a lot of you, I'm sure, were riveted to your television screens yesterday to watch yesterday's Senate Help Committee hearing and the expert testimony. Uh, maybe you were watching Jeff Sessions. I don't know. Uh, but I think if you see that, that, that was... Uh, a that was organized around a similar topic, and uh, as a policy wonk like myself, uh, it's a little disappointing because there seems to be a lot more smoke than light right now on what we're going to do about um, drug pricing and also the flow of funds. And so I'm really pleased to, that uh, my colleagues and I are able to host this event and actually discuss what might be some uh, policy solutions uh, to realize more value from the supply chain. And, you know, when we think about the supply chain, we're talking about uh, how money flows from both uh, the patient's pocket all the way up to the manufacturers responsible uh, for uh, producing the drugs. Uh, just a, a word about format. We're going to have two panels uh, today. One is on brands and the other is on generics. The issues are quite different uh, in both cases. In the case of brands, uh, we're often talking about higher priced drugs that have some uh, that account for about two thirds of spending, but only about 10% of prescriptions. Um, and uh, in the uh, and and there's concern about high prices, but also about the value and how we think about uh, rewarding innovation. On ge the generic side, that uh, dominates the prescriptions in the marketplace, probably about 90% of them, um, and that's a market that works surprisingly well, in my view, with a few very notable exceptions that have really monopolized uh, the attention. Um, and so figuring out how to get these things right uh, without destroying what works in the market, and I do think some things work, uh, is really quite important. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, uh, Paul Ginsberg will be moderating the first panel on brands, and I know he's going to be uh, – uh, excellent in that role. Uh, Paul is a colleague of mine at USC, and, but he also leads the Brookings uh, Schaefer Initiative, and he holds the Leonard D. Schaefer Chair here at Brookings. Um, but before I invite Paul up, uh, we're going to have a presentation on the flow of funds in the pharmaceutical distribution system by Neeraj Sood. Uh, Neeraj is the Director of Research at the USC Schaefer Center. He's also my dean, so I have to be nice to him. Uh, but I think, very importantly, uh, he brings an expert voice. And again, as I said, there's a lot of smoke uh, and not much light. He really is starting to shine a light into this area. He's also done extensive work with the National Academy of Sciences, uh, thinking about um, novel strategies to eliminate hep C. So I can't think of someone better suited uh, to start us off than Neeraj. Thank you. Dina, thank you for that introduction, and welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here. So the goal for my talk today is let me first start by the disclosure, since the talk is about following the money. So this research was funded by the Schaefer Center and by Amgen. All views expressed here are mine. So I'm going to talk about two things. One is just explaining how drugs reach from manufacturers to consumers and who are the different players involved in the supply chain. And the second is I'm going to give you a big picture idea of who's making how much money.
So kind of the idea is if you as a consumer are spending $100 on drugs, how is that $100 split across different players in the supply chain? And how much of that $100 ultimately reaches the manufacturer who's the one who's kind of manufacturing the drug or came up with the drug? So if you start with drugs, they start from the manufacturer. The manufacturer then uh, sells the drugs to a wholesaler. The wholesaler in turn sells the drugs to a pharmacy. And finally, you go to the pharmacy, to the CVS, and you get the drugs. So the parties who are kind of touching the drugs in the supply chain are the manufacturer, to the wholesaler, to the pharmacy, to the beneficiary. And this seems like a pretty straightforward supply chain. But when you start looking at the flow of funds, things get a lot more complicated. So you as a consumer have insurance. And so you're paying, when you go to the pharmacy, you're paying a copay or a cost sharing to the pharmacy when you get the drug. At the same time, you're paying premiums to the, your health insurance plan. And your health insurance plan is using some of these premiums to pay for the drugs. Your employer, which in this case is USC for me, is also paying premiums to the health insurance plan. The pharmacy is paying drug acquisition costs to the wholesaler, and the wholesaler is paying a wholesale price to the manufacturer. But now there is another party called the PBM. The manufacturer also sometimes directly assists consumers through copay assistance programs or patient assistance programs. What PBMs do is they get rebates in terms of the flow of funds from manufacturers, and they also get money from the health plan. They pass on some of these rebates back to the health plan, and they take the money from the health plan and also pay the pharmacy for, uh, for drugs. So you can kind of see that the flow of funds here is fairly complicated with a lot of money changing hands and a lot of different parties involved. So the reason this money is changing hand is because these different parties are providing different services. And it's kind of, it's, it's an important context to think about when we show you the numbers in the end about who's making how much money, you should be thinking about who is doing what in the supply chain. And you should be just juxtaposing uh, the two things. So what the health plans do is they provide you prescription drug coverage. So they're taking on some of the medical risk. If you have high prescription drug costs, it's the health plan who's responsible for them. Similarly, the pharmacy is responsible for retail distribution. So they're the ones who have the brick and mortar stores. They're the ones who take on some of the inventory risk in terms of keeping the drugs. And if the drugs aren't sold, then you know that's their loss. Wholesalers also take on some inventory risk, but typically they take the drugs from the manufacturer and quickly kind of supply them to the pharmacy. PBMs are in some sense pure middlemen that they don't take on any inventory risk or medical expenditure risk. What they do is negotiate prices. They negotiate prices with the manufacturer and also they negotiate prices with pharmacies. So in that sense, they negotiate prices, they keep some of those price savings and then pass some of them back to the health plan. And finally, the manufacturer is the one who, is, who first came up with the drug through R&D and then is responsible for selling the drug through marketing and actually producing the drug. So they take on huge risk in terms of, you know, if the clinical trial is not successful, they bear the cost of that. Or even once a drug is successful, if health plans don't cover the drug, then they're, you know, they're taking a loss on, on the drug. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this conceptual framework that we had before. And then first we're gonna identify who are the players in each market segment. So who are the top PBMs, who are the top retailers, who are the top manufacturers, health plans, and so on. And fortunately for us, a lot of these top players are publicly traded and publicly traded firms routinely disclose financial statements to the Securities and Exchange Commission. So we're gonna use those financial statements which are publicly reported to look at two things. One is gross profits. So here, what gross profits capture is basically the revenue that comes in less your cost of goods sold. So let's look at, say, gross profits for wholesalers. The revenue they get is from pharmacies or from the retail segment because the retail segment is buying the drugs from the wholesalers. So their revenue is whatever money they got from the retail pharmacy and their cost of goods sold is whatever money they gave 
to purchase the drugs to the manufacturer. So you can see that by looking at the gross margin, you're basically looking at the total markup of the wholesaler, which is how much money did they keep in the middle between the pharmacy and the manufacturer. So between the player up the supply chain and below the supply chain. And now what do you do with this money? Some of this money you spend on operating costs that you, know, you need to have your warehouses and so on. And the other part of the money you keep as profits. So that money that you keep as profits is what we call net profits. So financial statements report both things. They report gross profits and net profits. So once we have this information and you combine that with the conceptual framework we had before, we can kind of paint a picture at a big picture level who's making how much money and who's keeping money along the way in the supply chain. So if you look at the profit margins, not surprisingly, manufacturers you know, have the highest profit margin because they're the ones who are doing the R&D and making the drug. Uh, the other two players who have high profit margins are health plants and pharmacies at about 20% each because, again, they're taking on risk. Health plants take on medical risk. Pharmacies take on inventory risk. PBMs, who are pure middlemen, make about 6%, and wholesalers have a gross profit margin of about 4%. So if you take these gross profit margin numbers and combine them with the conceptual framework, what you get is if a consumer who's insured goes to, say, CVS, a retail pharmacy, and buys a prescription drug. So out, out of the $100 in spending by this insured consumer on part of the consumer as well as on part of the health plan, about $19 are going to be kept by the insurer about $5 are going to be kept by the PBM, about $15 are going to be kept by the pharmacy, and $2 are going to be kept by the wholesaler. And what remains is the $58 that goes to the manufacturer. And what the manufacturer does with this is about $17 goes towards cost of goods sold or production costs, and about $41 goes into marketing, R&D, profits, and other operating costs. Now, we can kind of paint the same picture for brands versus generics. We're going to have a generic panel after this. And these numbers are not directly based from SEC statements because the SEC statements don't break out revenues by brand versus generics. So these are based on industry reports. So... I think the, the key point here is that generic manufacturers, even though they have, and you know, it makes sense that they should have lower profit margins than branded gener manufacturers, they still have pretty high gross profit margins. So they're still at 50% despite not having any expenses for R&D and so on. The other kind of important thing is that the middlemen, which are the PBMs, pharmacies, and wholesalers, they make much more money on generics compared to brands. And maybe this is the reason why 90% of the prescriptions in the U.S. are generics, because there is a clear incentive for the middlemen to push generics compared to brands. <coughs> so basically, if you now take these gross profit margins and then do the same calculation, what would happen to $100 spent on a branded drug versus what would happen to $100 spent on a generic drug, what you get is that PBMs will make, say, roughly $7 on a generic compared to $2, of spend, $2 on a branded drug. So again, much higher incentives for PBMs uh, to have generic volume. Similarly, pharmacies have a lot more market power here. They make about $32 on every $100 spent on generics compared to only $3 on brands. And wholesalers also capture about $8 on every $100 spent on generics compared to $3 on brands. So you can see that all the middlemen have stronger financial incentives to push uh, generic sales. Now you can kind of look at what do net profit margins look like. So these are not the total operating costs for the middlemen. This is the actual money they give back to their shareholders. So this is the actual returns to shareholders of these uh, publicly traded firms. So manufacturers have a net profit margin of about 26%. Wholesalers uh, have a very small net profit margin of 0.5%. Pharmacies have a net profit margin of 4%. PBMs have a net profit margin of 2.3%.
and health plans have a net profit margin of 3%. So if you take these numbers from uh, the SEC filings and then again do this thought experiment, that if a consumer spends $100 on prescription drugs, how much of this is in some sense pure profit for people in the supply chain? And the answer to that is for every $100 in spending, you get $23 in net profits for different players in the industry. And how is this $23 split across various players? Insurers make about $3. PBMs make about $2. Pharmacies make about $3. Wholesalers make $0.30. Cents, and manufacturers make, or the people who do manufacturing and R&D make about $15. So in some sense, this is where kind of the easy part of my talk stops. That this is kind of the descriptive part of the talk. That who's making how much money? How does the market work? The more difficult question is, is any player making more money than they ought to be? Is any player making excessive returns? And what should we do about it? And that is where I think you know, the panel and the moderator come in, that they're going to answer that question or they're going to debate that question. But to just kind of start the discussion going or the debate going, I have a few thoughts on that. So if you're thinking about, is any player making excessive profits? maybe there are like three things you could do. You could compare the profit each player is making to actually what each player does and the risks they take. So players who take on more risks should be making more profits. You can compare profits to other similar industries. And I hear I have similar within quotes because it's very difficult to come up with what industries are similar. You know, that depends upon their business model, it depends upon the risks they're taking, and so on. But I still wanted to give you some numbers on what this looks like. And finally, you can evaluate as economists, we say, you make a lot of profits if, you have, if there are monopolies, if you have market power. So you can look at kind of the degree of competition in the market or the degree of concentration in the market. So if you look at the risk that different players take, Manufacturers probably take on the highest risk. So they take on the R&D risk of all the clinical trial activity in coming up with the drug, and then they take on the sales risk of actually selling the drug once they've produced it. Wholesalers and pharmacies take on some inventory risk. So that is basically, they purchase the drugs, and then if the drugs are not sold, that inventory is their risk. And insurers take on medical risk. So if they have a consumer who purchases a lot of drugs, the insurer is just getting a fixed premium from this consumer, and they're responsible for the excessive uh, medical costs. PBMs here are pure middlemen. As I said, they're basically negotiating prices, so they're not actually taking on any risk. They don't touch the drugs. They basically negotiate who's going to get how much, and they take a cut in the middle. If you look at profits, so what we've done is kind of compared branded and generic manufacturers to others in the manufacturing industry. And you can see that these are fairly disparate industries. So I don't know if this is you know, a valid comparison. For example, we're comparing manufacturers to manufacturers of auto parts, semiconductor software, and so on. But at least among manufacturers, it seems that the net profit margins of pharmaceutical firms are higher than those of others in the manufacturing sector. Uh, we see that drug wholesalers make you know, little less than food wholesalers. And we see health insurers have net profit margins lower than other insurers. And we see PBMs was a tough thing that we were like, how, who do we compare PBMs to? And so the best example we could come up with was realtors. That you know, it's like a realtor who matches a buyer to a seller. So a PBM is matching a health plan to a manufacturer. The only thing is that, you know, with a realtor, I know what my seller is selling at and what my buyer is buying at. With PBMs, it's more complicated because they negotiate rebates, but I don't kind of see the rebates, or either parties might not see the full rebates. But it seems PBMs are making you know slower net margins uh, than real estate. And similarly, pharmacies are kind of making more margins, are higher margins than several other retailers other than you know, building supplies. So it seems Home Depot makes more money than CVS. <laughs> <clears throat> so when you look at the markets, the last question was, you know, are these markets highly concentrated? And the answer is yes. So the top three PBMs control 
about two thirds of the market. So that by, you know, traditional antitrust standards would be FTC standards would be highly concentrated markets. The top three wholesalers control 80% of the market share and the top three pharmacies control 50% of the market share. Manufacturing is less concentrated, but in some sense, concentration is less important here because manufacturers have patents on the drug and market exclusivity granted by the FDA. So by design or the government is in some sense granting them some market power. Most players also have some questionable practices. I'm not going to go into details of these because I have 30 seconds left. Uh, but, you know, manufacturers use, sometimes are, are accused of using aggressive promotion practices, uh, health plans sometimes charge consumers more than the actual cost of acquiring the drug. So you're paying the health plan a premium and, a, and the copay on your drug could be higher than the actual cost of the drug. So that doesn't seem fair. Pharmacies, seem to, there seems to be, you know, some market power there that different consumers pay different prices to pharmacies. And PBMs, I think the biggest thing is they seem to hide the rebates. Like when I look at the SEC statements, there isn't a separate line for saying revenues from rebates. So that's hidden from me. So I don't know how much of those rebates are passed on to the health plan. So in some sense, this brings to the panel discussion that what are the policy solutions for making the drug distribution system more efficient? So maybe Amazon will be the answer here, or uh, because they said they're going to get into this business. Uh, but I think we, we really need uh, to think hard about what the policy interventions here are, and we have an esteemed panel uh, to help us with that. Thank you.